you know, the thesis there is the supply of medical space in Beverly Hills was very, very limited. There is absolutely scarcity in the in the market, but I will tell you there there is still a lot of pent up demand for the sector. And so I think that there's there's plenty of capital to invest in real estate. But right now, especially in healthcare real estate, it, it needs to be the right real estate. A lot of development groups, in fact, one of my prior employers, Pacific Medical Buildings, they had a statistic at one point, and I believe it, that it was something like 85 or 90 plus percent of their business was repeat clients. This is Maestro Minute the show that discusses all things real estate, sharing interviews with the most successful people in the industry. Hear from their perspective and what they are doing to achieve success. Get exclusive tips on how you can also succeed in real estate. Maestro Minute is brought to you by Maestro Development. Here's your host, Nareg Muradian. Welcome everybody to Maestro Minute. I'm your host, as we said in the introduction, Nareg Muradian. Today, I'm super excited. We got a special guest today. I think you guys are going to enjoy. Uh, we have Andrew Saba here. Thanks for coming. Of course. Thanks for having me. Awesome. I'm not awesome. sure how special I am, but I'll take it. I'll take well, it. we'll find out at the end of the video how special you are. My parents think I'm special. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you're special. Oh. That's why we have you here. So, Flatter you'll get you everywhere. So just a little bit about you, Andrew. Um, you're responsible for healthcare investment. You're, you're at Stockdale Capital Partners right now. You've been there for or you've had 20 years of experience uh, with some of the best investors and developers across the country, spanning in different types of operations, leasing, investment, asset management. You got your MBA from USC, congratulations, and uh, Master of Science in Communication from Florida State. Uh, that's awesome. So uh, thanks for being here. Of course, thanks for having me. So today we're gonna talk more about development, specifically in the healthcare world. Um, so let's get right into it. How, how did you get into development and in healthcare? <laughs> it's funny, I was talking to someone, I think a week ago, and he was asking me like how I got to where I am. And it's it's a pretty circuitous route. I When I was at uh, Florida State, I originally thought I was gonna make like beer commercials. I just wanted to be like an account exec in-house for like Bud, Budweiser. And I just did not have an appreciation for the industry or understanding of how it really worked. and I frankly, just lacked initiative to really pursue it. And so out of undergrad, I kind of fell out and I started working for a company that my stepmom was working for in uh, the accounting department. And it happened to be uh, one of the most prolific medical development firms in the country, uh, Rendina. And um, I started with their operations and property management department for um, you know three and a half years. Shortly after that, they relocated me out to, here to LA and I'm from South Florida. You know, a year into it, I thought to myself, do I love it? Not really, but the fundamentals of the industry made a lot of sense. And so I stuck with it. I mean, even 20 years ago, the writing was on the wall. You could, you could see that we were an aging population and that population was gonna need to have care. And, you know, hospitals were likely to just continue to grow. And, and I think, generally speaking, that trend has played out. Um, and so that was one of the things that kept me in the industry and I just kind of stuck with it. Invested a lot in myself, like in terms of just getting ancillary education, training, um, things like an RPA designation, real estate license, CCIM. You can do all these things to like improve yourself, the MBA, another example, just to make you a little bit more astute and like to apply a broader lens of how you look at your job and what you do on a daily basis. So that's kind of how I got to where I am. And I would say over the years, I've just kind of progressed what I'd say closer to the capital, meaning just getting closer to the decision makers generally through just getting better. So you came here, you were here, and then you jumped from that firm to Stockdale to, or did you go no, to some other No, so firms? after Rendina, I joined a group called Pacific Medical Buildings in uh, their management division. Uh, about a year after that, I was getting ready to go to grad school and they offered me a, a pretty significant advancement for, at the time, a, a pretty junior guy to run the West Coast um, leasing division for, um, for their own properties. And so I built out a leasing team, okay. ran that team for several years while going to grad school. And after that, uh, went to a subsidiary Marcus and Millichap called Meridian. 
and stayed with them for about a year and a half or so. And from at that point, I really started moving into capital markets and focusing more on like the investment side of the business, really understanding like, you know, how all the numbers make sense. Because, you know, when you're in operations and leasing, you focus a lot on how buildings are run and how to get folks in the buildings and the economics matter. But, you know, in my in the last eight or so years of my career, I focused a lot more on the how much buildings cost and like the capitalization of those buildings. What I mean by that is how you purchase them, whether that's it's owned with debt or equity or combination of the two. Yeah. And so that's kind of what I've been focusing on more over the last eight years of, of my career. What would you say is the uniqueness or the specialty in healthcare when you're doing development? What are the things you look at or look for? you know, for healthcare? It depends on a lot, right? Um, some of it is market specific. You know, there's there's ways to play in and around the sector. Um, I've always said that the real estate matters first. After that, it's it's where the providers are going to come from. And, and But if you have well-located real estate, it will be, it, it'll prove as a defensive investment positioning relative to other um, components of the real estate. But as you think about like healthcare development in particular, a lot of that is just driven by user demand. Yeah. Frankly, you're at the front of that in right. a lot of ways. Like you see the the user demand requirements because they're coming to you well in advance of even kicking off um, either tenant improvements, which are the interior fit outs within the buildings or shell and core new development right. construction for those providers. What, what kind of products do you see in healthcare development right now that you guys are working on or you think are in demand? So we've been focused uh, predominantly on more acquisition and less development, though we have been working through the city of L.A., in fact, on a very large medical office building that we just recently got entitled. It's a 145,000 square foot medical office building that'll be at the corner of San Vicente and Wilshire, just over the city line of Beverly Hills. Is that that Big Five location? Correct. Yeah, it's, a, it's presently a Big Five sporting goods store right now. You know, the thesis there is um, the supply of medical space in Beverly Hills was very, very limited. And not only was it limited, but it was also at one point restricted. In 2011, for instance, the city put a moratorium on the delivery of medical office space. So it prevented you from actually converting or delivering any new medical space into that market. And what you would have expected that to have happened took place, which is the vacancies plummeted, that you had sub 3% vacancy at certain points, and the cost of that space skyrocketed because anyone who needed to provide medical care inside Beverly Hills had to pay a pretty penny for it. So you talked a little bit about accessing and doing acquisitions and. Um... What is it like for um, like capital? Seems like it's hard to get capital these days with the market. <laughs> yeah. What's your experience with that? Like, what do you see out there for, for that? 14 or so years, we've had very accommodating monetary policy that has led to essentially cheap money in the market for a long time. Very recently, uh, since the beginning of 2022, the Fed started hiking interest rates and that has essentially led to capital becoming increasingly expensive. All that's to say that return expectations need to moderate to um, to catch up with that. There is absolutely scarcity in the in the market, but I will tell you there there is still a lot of pent up demand for the sector. And so I think that there's there's plenty of capital to invest in real estate, but right now, especially in healthcare real estate, it needs to be the right real estate. And it's 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 a risk off environment. So I think there's an opportunity now to uh, to deploy capital into what I'd call choice assets, where you see like a flight to quality. And you're going to see that on the investment side. There is there is no shortage of capital for de-risked projects, but there's absolutely limited appetite, if if none at all, for anything that's a little bit riskier, which would be something like speculative development where you're going to build a building that doesn't have any pre-lease or an office to medical conversion without a very strong uh, either pre-lease tenant in tow, meaning that you're bringing a tenant use requirement to put into the building when you buy it. Just knowing that you're building into a market like that Beverly, Beverly Hills market before they recently lifted the moratorium where the vacancy was sub 3%, you know, that's a market where you could potentially feel confident knowing that you'll get the right. provider demand there. There's a huge focus on office conversion to residential. I know there was healthcare conversion as well. Do you see that still being a strong suit in the market? I think there will be 
opportunities for that. I think right now construction costs are playing a major role in a lot of what is and is not feasible, especially out here. I, you know, on the West Coast, I think we've we've just been dealing with elevated construction pricing for so long that our lens gets a little skewed. And so when we look out at other markets and we hear tenant improvement figures, they're substantially lower than what we see here, but they're still elevated relative to where I would say their their norms were 10 to 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think some of that is driven by, um, you know, the fact that there is a, a steady supply of medical inventory being delivered every year. What other markets do you see growing outside of the California area? We're as a firm targeting and following a lot of secondary city migration where um, the major gateway cities such as Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, Chicago, they've become very expensive and folks have left to go find, you know, the, the creature comforts that are offered in a major city, but like at a lower cost point. And so we're seeing the, the benefactors being, um, you know, Tampa, Atlanta, Nashville, Charlotte, uh, Austin, Phoenix, and we've been following that migration. Uh, our firm has historically been West Southwest focused. And, you know, today now we're looking nationally. And so we're following a lot of the Sunbelt migration and we're following low cost environments where a lot of retirees are looking to live that, you know, when they have fixed income, having a lower cost is just simply, you know, a prudent choice. What's your um, strategy on acquisition? How do you, what do you, what do you do to kind of compete? There's so many different, you know, healthcare developers out there that are looking for that right deal, that right location, right, that right product. What is it specifically that you think makes you guys or you successful in that world as far as looking for acquisitions, like your relationships with brokers? What what is it that gets you? You think those good opportunities? You know, some of it I will say is having the confidence to know um, what happens after you close. Underwriting a deal, I don't wanna say it's it's like a commodity, but um, you, know, you can teach someone enough about the sector in a short period of time so that they can become dangerous. And, and, and I mean that in terms of like competitive, but um, really understanding how to work the relationships with the healthcare systems, how to run the assets and, and having that be a seamless interaction and a consistent flow of communication from from the top down to the boots on the ground, I think is essential. And and that's a differentiator. You know, the reality is capital is capital. And at some point, it, I don't want to say it reaches parity, but it's really a the differentiator becomes who the providers want to work with. And you see that in a lot of development groups. In fact, one of my prior employers, Pacific Medical Buildings, I they had a statistic at one point, and I believe it, that it was something like 85 or 90 plus percent of their business was repeat clients. And I, that is a huge figure. And that, that should tell you that success is something that's reinforced with how you handle your clients and not necessarily just about cost. You know, I think when you take that same philosophy about treating your clients right, and, and this is this goes across all businesses, then you, you're just opening yourself up for more opportunities, both with that client as well as their collaborators and competitors. No, that's absolutely true. Clients are, you, you know, everything is client fo focused and centric. So with healthcare growing, the demand still being strong, where, where do you see like the market going in the healthcare industry? Like what, let's, we talked a little bit about AI, but, like where do you see the market going? there's the overhang of like the older building stock within the healthcare real estate sector, right? And then we also have what a lot of people believe to be a, a glut of office space that has yet to really figure itself out as far as what the utilization is really gonna be. Look, I'm not gonna speak for every employer. I think a large number of employers would sincerely prefer to have the company back. They, they are either anecdotally or even statistically showing that the effectiveness of the work from home regime hasn't really been as promised. And so I think, you know, look, will all of the office space that we built be used uh, again, maybe in time, but I think for now, there's going to be a lot of conversations about what else it can be. 
And, uh, you know, look, I, I, I do think some of it could serve as medical space. It, it's just a question of, is it well located? Does it have the parking cater to modern medicine? And, and what I mean by that is, does it have the mechanical electrical plumbing capabilities? Does it have the slab slab heights that you're looking for? You know, all of these things matter. And, and also it needs to be a, a, a building that is a, a place for healing. And I know that that sounds a little bit gimmicky, but the reality is that there there is substantial data on the actual places where people go to get care that reinforces the the treatment if people feel like they're in a nice warm like healing environment that feeling actually has a, a an impact on the right. level of care that they get and that's interesting because with the evolution of artificial intelligence you kind of lose that i feel like a little bit it comes becomes a little bit more clinical and less interpersonal but i would argue that actually what's happened since the proliferation of electronic medical records has, has actually taken the personal element a step back because I think a lot of physicians would probably agree to some extent that a lot of their job is about documentation and sitting behind a computer. I think AI can meaningfully improve what's taken place since the, you know, the the mass rollout of electronic medical record. That's pretty exciting as you think about it. I think that will have a much greater impact than um, telehealth, where a lot of people were, were fearful that telehealth would have a meaningful impact on uh, healthcare in the right. US. My personal view, and I think I have to preface all of this with right. this is my view and may not necessarily represent the views of our my, my firm or our shareholders, et cetera. I don't see telehealth meaningfully replacing a, a significant portion of healthcare. The, the reality is that there's a, such a liability in misdiagnosis, especially in the US, that until that changes or until um, there's some kind of contractual or legislative shift where people can have kind of a no harm, no foul digital consult where they recognize that like, hey, doctor could get this wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, that that will likely not change the person to person element that like frankly is integral to true care like you the physical element of people being with each other is healing versus right. having something digital I, I like i don't know the statistics on the digital component but i do know that there is data supporting that like the physical human in-person interaction does have a positive uh yeah. outcome i agree it'll be interesting to see how that goes um so some of the viewers that are watching, they want to get into healthcare, healthcare development. What do you recommend that they do? They don't have any experience in that world. How do they jump in and get some experience? First, they don't, because I'm not trying to introduce do too it. many other competitors. You yeah, just don't I, do it? yeah, I want to leave it for, for us. <laughs> uh, and then the second thing is uh, go into healthcare because we need, we need more healthcare providers. We don't need more healthcare developers. Understanding the, the real estate is important but there's a lot of different ways to get into development and there's there's a lot of different roles in development as well um you know what you do in construction management yeah. and delivery is a critical component of the development cycle and that's one of the more important pieces that as you think about a successful developer that differentiates the good from the mediocre is that they're able to deliver projects you know on time on budget and that the client ultimately wanted and some of those skills don't necessarily need you to go to a quote developer school to get to. You can learn how to deliver for clients in any industry and you take that skill set with you to, to something like this. I'm a believer that people are inherently capable of doing pretty much anything. Obviously, you're not going to walk in and do a surgery as a, a layman, myself included, right. day one. But um, I do think people can be taught. I think what what matters is you look at what a developer does and they are essentially providing a, a service to a client and you know that service can be chopped up and kind of compartmentalized now to where you can do what's called like a fee development where you just build something for a client that's ultimately going to own it like a healthcare system yeah. or you could do something where you build it for them and then you own it and that's kind of the more traditional model and then everything up and down and in between where you give them options to purchase it later or you can find a capital partner which would be a group like us where um, we can come in either you know, look if it's a pre-lease development we could come in before you start building to determine you know where that 
that sale price is going to be, which allows the developer to figure out where the rent needs to be on the price of the project. And that's, I mean, an oversimplification, but that's kind of yeah. how, how I would say you, the, the development game works, but also like how you could get into development is just seeing how and where you can play within that. I don't know if I'm yeah, that totally makes sense. Directly answering the question. I think you are. Uh, you <laughs> said don't get into it. I did. I was I was trying to be as nebulous as possible so that I can confuse people away from the yeah. sector. Would you say there's one development that you've worked on in your career that you probably you think about often and excites you, or maybe went the wrong way? I don't know. What lessons learned do you have? What exciting things do you have? in the last 20 plus years. <laughs> you know, it's funny, it's one of the first lessons I learned. There was a doctor in Florida, I'll, I'll withhold his name because no one wants to be associated with being a delinquent tenant, but I was like just starting out as a property manager and I you know, noticed he was late paying his rent and I tried to get a hold of him a, a few times through his office staff and never got him. And then at some point I just started writing rent demand letters. And you know, I think what was lost in that is, you know, you open up the procedure manual and that's just what you do. You have to always remember that, you know, we are people at the end of the day and like people want to be treated the, hopefully like with some level of dignity and respect. And, you know, it's basically treat others as you would like to be treated. And I lost sight of that pretty early. And so I had to be reminded of that. And I, I think since then that, that message stuck with me. Uh, you know, it was probably first couple years of my career. And ever since then I am, <laughs> Uh, probably overly so sensitive to my messaging and how I come across, especially to prospective clients and investors. I always will read and reread things before they go out to a client just because I want to make sure that I'm saying it exactly the way I want it to come across. Yeah, and I think this is super important, uh, having FaceTime, having yeah. conversations, emails, texts, phone calls are great, but when there's an issue or you want to have like kind of a conversation about something, it's always goes more smoothly in person, you know, and I think during the pandemic that was kind of lost, especially now with virtual meetings and all that. But I think getting together, you know, breaking bread, meeting together is great. I mean, kind of, we've been working together for a while. I haven't seen you for a while. So this is great. I to missed have you too. Here. Yeah. I missed you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that's all I had. Um, it's great to see you. Thank you for coming on the show. Of course. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so that's your Maestro Minute of the day. Uh, thanks for watching. Hopefully you liked. Uh, don't forget to subscribe. And uh, we'll see you on the next video. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in to the Maestro Minute podcast. Make sure to rate this podcast if you found it helpful, share it with a friend that could use it, and follow us on all major podcast platforms. The Maestro Minute powered by Maestro Development.